Welcome back, everybody, to the Retrograde right here on Dead Jester Cinema. What is the Retrograde? Well, it's quite simple. We're going to go through an old movie, and then when it's all said and done, I'm going to break that movie down into four main categories. Plot, characters, direction, and music. And I'm going to assign a letter grade to each of those four categories. And then when it's all done, I will then combine those grades into one cumulative score for the entire film. And on this episode of The Retrograde, we're going to look at Children of the Corn 5, Fields of Terror. Oh boy. The film opens up on a slow-mo shot of someone's hand crushing a rose. Why? Uh, I don't really know. All I can think of is that possibly they confused rose, like he who walks behind the rose, as in the corn rose, with the flower rose. I mean, your guess is as good as mine. Either way, it's pretty, pretty stupid. Anyway, after that pointless and artistic nonsense, we find Ezekiel wandering through the cornfield where he stumbles upon a random devil fire, so you know what that means. Time to get possessed! So fast forward a year, because plot? And Ezekiel shows up at some random farmer's house all pissed off, saying his corn belongs to them. And rather than talk it out, he uses his dark side force powers and... Oh. Oh. Oh my. Anyway, he summons his army of brats to kill the farmer's wife and... Alright, hold up. Hold up. I, I need a little something here. I need a little bit of liquid courage, you know. This is gonna go really well. Do Children of the Corn, I thought. It'd be fun. Nobody's really done it, I thought, you know. Oh, Jesus. Boy, this is this is really gonna suck. These two asshats, Laszlo and Charlotte, are on a road trip with their friends, Allison, Greg, Kerr, and Tyrus, who are going somewhere to spread or bury the ashes of their dead buddy, I guess. I don't wanna look at that. <laughs> I don't wanna look at this either, Ava. Believe me. Anyway, back to these two, and while Laszlo is posting another one of his stupid blow-up doll markers, dumbass Charlotte wanders into the cornfield to pick some corn. Why? Because she's stupid and we need an excuse to kill her off because, you know, body count and all. So yeah, she's killed off rather quickly, followed soon after by Laszlo who chokes out a stupid one-liner before getting his head chopped off. That doesn't look right. <laughs> oh, this is going so great. Meanwhile, the other band of idiots get distracted by one of Laszlo's deflated dolls and get run off the road. They are then greeted by Ezekiel who warns them that they are on private property, but then gives them directions to the nearest town, where they wander into a bar and, hey, look kids, it's Jason Voorhees. When complaining about a foul smell in town, one of the locals speaks up and says it's coming from the property of a resident religious fanatic named Luke Enright, where he also houses a bunch of wayward kids who worship he who walks behind the rose. This revelation makes Allison want to leave town, and outside they run into town sheriff, played by Fred Williamson. You know, for a shit movie, this has got some pretty notable names in it. He tells them that the next bus out of town is at 8pm, which they miss, obviously. But hey, you know, they do have a car back in the cornfield, I mean, I guess they could, you know, just walk back to it and push it out and... Uh, no, no, forget that. Looking for a place to crash for the night, they stumble upon that random farmer's house from the beginning of the movie. Here, Allison reveals that their buddy in the urn, who was Kerr's boyfriend, didn't die in an accident, but he committed suicide because... Uh, who fucking cares? Seriously, it's a plot point that goes absolutely nowhere. Later, Allison confesses to Greg that she has guilt over abandoning her younger brother Jacob with their abusive and alcoholic father. And after that bit of left field story exposition is over, Kerr is startled by a corn kid creeper. And when Allison and Greg go to investigate, they discover the bodies of their friends Laszlo and Charlotte in the cornfield. So the next day, when the police show up, they try to explain their innocence, but Sheriff Hammer doesn't trust them. And why start now? Because you know they never do in these movies. 
Looking for answers, the quartet go to Luke Enright's farm because Allison wants to talk to her brother Jacob. It is set up that Jacob did leave home to run away and devote his life to he who walks behind the rose, but even with all that, it is still a big, big, stupid, convenient plot of convenience that he's hanging out with these freaks at this farm. Here they meet Luke Enright himself, played by David Carradine, and he expounds on some bullshit that he's a savior and prophet to all these wayward children. I mean, it's all really stupid anyway, so who cares, it's not really worth elaborating on more. Allison eventually demands to see her brother, and Enright allows her to do so, and upon reuniting with Jacob, she begs him to leave the farm. But Jacob explains he's cool with staying, even though his attitude says differently. Ezekiel then barges in and tells Allison she needs the GTFO, and Jacob gives her his copy of Corn Deities for Dummies as a parting gift. During this time, Kerr, who has wandered away from adult supervision, makes eyes with Corn Child Zane, who wants to tell her all about his lord and savior. But before he can close the deal, Kerr decides that it might be best to go back to her friend. You know, now might be the perfect time to bring up just how much of a ditzy slut Kerr is. I mean, they're out here to spread the ashes of her boyfriend or whoever the hell that was and now she's off getting busy with one of her friends and now she's trying to mac on this uh, Zeke guy from the corn cult or whatever and it's just brilliant, brilliant character development there. It's the pain. Away. Back at Farmer Fran's squad house, the group is now just sitting around doing jack shit when Ty decides he's had enough of this movie and wants out, and Kerr and Greg decide to join him. Meanwhile, Allison starts to read her brother's book and discovers that all the children at the age of 18 have to sacrifice themselves to he who walks behind the rose. And guess what? It's her brother's 18th birthday tomorrow. Wait, 18? I thought it was 19. We go to him. The first night of our 19th year. Oh, whatever. Who gives a crap? It's not like continuity has mattered between these films up to this point anyway. Anywho, the three sucketeers who previously wanted out of this movie have a change of heart and decide to stick around a little while longer. Because, you know, good writing and all. But when they return to their squad house looking for Allison, they suddenly lose track of Kerr, who seemingly vanishes into thin air. Back in Enright's farm, Jacob's sacrifice party has commenced, but at the last minute he smartens up and is like, F this, I'm out, and ditches his corn posse. However, the show must go on and suddenly stupid ass Kerr appears out of nowhere and offers herself up as a sacrifice in place of Jacob by jumping into the silo that houses the eternal flame of he who walks behind the rose. And good riddance too, get the f**k out of this movie already, stupid, stupid character. And just for that, Kerr is the latest recipient of the Gullible Dumbass Award. Congratulations, Kerr, it is well deserved. But Jacob obviously wasn't getting out of this that easily, and he is kidnapped. And while captured, Ezekiel stabs him, but before he could finish him off, he's alerted by one of his minions that the police and fire department are on their way. So he leaves Zeke to clean up his mess. But you know, Zeke sucks and he allows Jacob to get free, but not very far as Jacob is succumbing to his stab wound. Meanwhile, Allison and the local 5-0 arrive on the scene, and Officer Badass confronts Enright to drop the hammer on him. Luke warns the sheriff that if he puts out that devil fire in the corn silo, great harm will come to them. Which does indeed happen in a hilariously bad scene. So after that brief detour through Suckville, the sheriff has had enough of Enright's shit and goes to arrest him. But Luke starts freaking out at him some via weird mind control from Ezekiel and oh, oh god, what the hell is happening? <laughs> what, what the hell is that? You know, seriously, f*** this franchise. I mean, they never, never ceases to amaze me the level of dumb, stupid shit this thing can sink to. I mean, who sat there and actually thought that that was going to look cool? Like, I did the conversation go something like, Hey, you know what? We know it would be really cool. How about, you know, we have the villain just mind control and and just make the dude's head explode kind of like scanners we could do that that would be nice but how about we just have some sort of you know demented muppet pop out of his body and just shoot fire at him like a flamethrower yes let's do that instead 
After that dumb shit, Ezekiel tells Allison he's been puppeteering Enright for years. But I guess maybe only a year, because I, I don't know, it doesn't make any sense. Allison then makes a break for it while Ezekiel isn't looking, grabs a shotgun, and blasts one of her kids on her way out. I got a shotgun! She does end up getting overpowered by one of the corn girls, but before she can kill Allison, Greg shows up out of nowhere to save the day. And hey, Allison, you may want to pick up that gun, um, um, the shotgun, hello? Are you going to pick that up or, or not? Whatever. Everyone in this movie is just a dumbass. Anyway, the two run into Tyrus, who can't find the keys to the cop car, and when they are ambushed by the kids, they run and hide in one of the barns. The same one that conveniently Jacob has been chilling in. Jacob then tells his sister he is sorry, and that to stop the fire, you gotta... And then he dies. Aww. <laughs> I'm sorry, it, it's just the acting is so bad. Tweedledee and Tweedledum stumble upon stupid Charlotte's car from the beginning of the movie that the kids had been hiding, but it obviously doesn't work, so when Greg tries to repair it, Tyrus goes off and gets himself killed by Z, who then sets his sights on Allison, but when he chases her to the hayloft, she offs his ass Roy Burns style. Greg, however, is not so lucky, and he gets trapped under the car, and with no way out, he decides to take a few of them down with him. I got your eternal flame right here! At this point, Allison grabs some fertilizer and gasoline and makes her way up to the top of the corn silo to extinguish the devil fire, but she runs into Ezekiel for one last final, uneventful, and tensionless showdown, and after she eliminates his ass from the Royal Rumble, she dumps the gas and fertilizer into the fire, extinguishing it once and for all. Oh no, no, that's not the end. We still got one more stupid scene to go. So after all the kids wander aimlessly out of this movie, we get an epilogue in which Allison meets Jacob's wifey, girlfriend, person, Lily, and her baby nephew. Lily lets Allison adopt her baby because she obviously can't raise him on her own. And in the final shot of the movie, as Allison is singing a lullaby to the baby, and, oh, oh, just give me a f***ing break. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was Children of the Corn 5. Let's just get this shit over with. See what this movie made me do? It made me knock over this sign. F***ing bullshit movie. The plot in this movie gets an F. Again, much like the last movie, what plot? You know, with this franchise, I've just come to expect the lack of a traditional plot structure, but... Holy shit, give me something. And I don't even count the crumbs of a story that they present with Allison and Jacob because it's hardly fleshed out. And it comes at a point during the movie where you've already stopped caring. Maybe if they had dropped hints to this and alluded to this earlier on in the film and properly set it up more, it could have been better. But instead, it comes completely out of left field. And are we seriously gonna believe that Allison had absolutely no freaking clue as to the general location she was in, and it had to be the name of He Who Walks Behind the Rose that somehow snapped her out of her mental block, that nothing else in regards to the town, nothing else did it, but that did. It's, it's just, it's just stupid. And speaking of stupid, the tone of this movie is just all over the place. Like, is this movie trying to take itself seriously or not? Because you have moments that are trying to be tense and scary, and I use those terms extremely loosely. Only to have those moments undercut by a stupid one-liner, or something that looks goofy and ridiculous. I don't really know if this movie is trying to be sardonic or not, but either way, it completely misses the mark. The characters here also get an F. I'm going to have a lot of trouble talking about the characters here because none of them had any discernible characteristics and they all sucked. And the two biggest standouts of that rogue gallery of awfulness are Ava Mendez and Alexis Marquette. I've seen Ava Mendez in later films, you know, later on in her career where she has been better than she is here, but it still does not help the fact that her character is poorly written and is performed equally as bad. 
but Alexis Marquette may go down as quite possibly one of the worst actors I have ever, ever seen. Well, at least in regards to the retrograde thus far. Because between this and his performance in Bride of Chucky, which I just reviewed the film prior, yeah, he is just terrible. Absolutely terrible. But beyond the main characters, even the actual name stars that they had in this movie sucked. And it has nothing to do with them as actors because I've seen them in other stuff and they're all great. But in a movie like this, with the combination of a shit script and shit production, it's not like they are given much room to do much of anything. So it all just comes off as heavy handed stunt casting. But in my opinion, the biggest form of stunt casting comes in the form of David Carradine. His might be the most useless star cameo in this movie because it's in a role that is completely superfluous and seems to only exist for the sake of adding a star power name to the cast. This role could have easily been consolidated down into just being Ezekiel, and it probably would have helped elevate that character as a main villain a little bit more, especially when he's been controlling David Carradine anyway, so what the f**k's the point? And I'll tell you what that point was, it was to draw your eye to that marquee. I mean, but what marquee, really? It's not like this movie was in the theaters, it was direct-to-video trash. The direction also gets an F. This is quite possibly the worst direction I have seen in one of these quote-unquote franchise films up to this point on this channel. It is flat and it is lifeless. It lacks any sort of creativity from both a shot selection standpoint and a lighting standpoint. And when they tried to do something creative, all they did was dutch that camera over and over and over and over. I mean shit, Batman and Robin had less dutch tilts. Plus, they made absolutely no attempt to even care enough to make this look like Nebraska, much less middle America in general. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't remember seeing palm trees and a giant f***ing mountain in Nebraska. Now I get that sometimes these things can kind of creep into the background, you may miss it from time to time, but these are just so blatantly in the frame, like, how the hell do you miss it? Plus, the look of this film from an aesthetic standpoint is extremely and nauseatingly 90s. And that might be a little nitpicky and unfair, but Children of the Corns 2, 3, and 4 were all in the same decade, and none of them felt as overtly 90s as this one does. I mean, shit, at times I was wondering if I'm watching Children of the Corn or a 90s alternative music video. Like, I expected the frickin' Spin Doctors to come make a random appearance. Not like that would have been out of place, considering all the other random-ass shit cameos that they had in this movie. And rounding out this quadrilogy of suck, the music gets an F because it's absolutely boring and forgettable. It's just bad. And yeah, I'm not going to cut away to any other scenes of the movie. There's no point to elaborate on it any further because it is just forgettable and awful. And the less said about it, the better. With those four shit grades combined, that brings the cumulative score up to a 55%, which means that Children of the Corn 5, Fields of Terror, has earned the letter grade of an F, and it's also earned the very first Dumpster Fire Award for being absolute shit. This was painful to sit through, I'm not gonna lie. And this franchise continues to prove me wrong, and just that when I think I've seen the worst of the worst, somehow they manage to push to new grounds of suckage with each new entry. There is a reason this movie gets the very first Dumpster Fire Award here, and that's because there's absolutely no redeeming value in watching this movie at all. The plot sucks, all the characters suck, the direction is ass, and the music is forgettable. Mix that all together, and you got a recipe for a shit sandwich in a movie that I would not recommend anybody to watch. But yeah, that's it for this episode of The Retrograde. This movie was just absolute, utter, utter dog shit. And I cannot recommend anybody to watch it unless you're kind of like me and you love to just punish yourself. In that case, have at it. But if you're looking to watch any of these movies or have any sort of genuine curiosity, uh, if you're interested in these Children of the Corn movies, so far, I would say just stick with the main three. And honestly, so far, just stick with the first one. Because all of them up to this point 
have sucked to varying degrees, but this film just took the suckage to a whole new level. But anyways, what are your guys' thoughts on Children of the Corn 5? If you have seen it, please post your comments below. As always, like, comment, and subscribe. Adios. Now, GTFO!